So thank you everyone for coming. This is part of the um, high school for uh, genomics for high school series, and um, there'll be another one. The next one will probably be in the first week of November. I'm trying to put together that program now. Um, but anyway, we uh, the website will have this video. If you have colleagues who are able to come, or your students who want to see it. And without any further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Bryce, who is in the Department of Dermatology at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be able to be here and give this lecture. Um, when I was a fellow at NIH, I um, gave lectures similarly um, for um, high school teachers and college professors trying to learn about genomics and specifically about the microbiome, which is what I'm going to cover today. Um, this is what I want to cover, the four main objectives and what is the microbiome and how do we study it using genomic techniques. Um, what constitutes a healthy microbiome and um, the Human Microbiome Project, which was an effort to um, describe and characterize what a normal human microbiome is, um, some of its roles in health and disease, and then end up with some therapeutic and diagnostic applications. So just interrupt me anytime if you have a question, feel free to ask. Um, so the human microbiome is, how we define it is it's the collective microbial genomes that are associated with the human body. And we hear about bacteria a lot, but there are other components as well, such as fungi, viruses. In the skin, um, there are mites that colonize our hair follicles. And of course, I'll draw off a lot of skin examples since that's really my area of expertise, but I'm going to cover many of the body sites at least. So all plants and animals are colonized with microorganisms and can be sort of um, considered superorganisms because not only do we have these human cells, we are colonized by many more bacterial cells than human cells. And um, as we will see, some of these microbes provide vital functions for health, and they provide functions that we haven't had to evolve on our own, in our own genetics. Um, so, for example, in the gut, um, the microbes that populate our GI tract have very important functions in helping us break down um, food products um, and synthesize vitamins that we aren't equipped to do from our own genomic material. So this puts things in perspective, I think. And I, I, you know, I was showing this to my husband last night, and he was like, well, how do they know that there's 10 to the 31 microbial cells on the earth? And to be honest, I, I don't know. I think this is an estimate. They don't know that that's the case. But starting from here, we know that per gram of feces, there are 10 to the 6 bacteria. But if you put that into perspective in the stars of the Milky Way, um, human cells in per human, and then microbial cells per human, this suggests that we contain an, a, um, a ratio of 10 more microbial cells to 10 microbial cells per single human cell in our body. Um, and that's pretty extraordinary, which makes us actually more microbial than human, if you think about it in terms of numbers. Um, so as I mentioned, the microbial census exceeds the total number of our human cells. Um, and it's an integral part of our genetic landscape because, as I said, it's this source of genetic diversity and genetic functions that we haven't had to evolve on our own. And as such, we know the human microbiome, the genetic content is about 100-fold more than the human, our own genome. So um, some of that doesn't affect us. Some of it's helpful to us. Some of it um, is maybe harmful to us depending on the type of bacteria and the type of interaction. Um, but 
As far as roles of bacterial communities in human health, these are um, some of those that I choose to highlight. As I mentioned in our gut, our gut microbiota is like this super generator, um, helping us break down our food and helping us to synthesize and excrete vitamins. Um, so that's certainly a vital role. Um, in just fulfilling a niche, and this goes back to some concepts about ecology and ecosystems, just by being there, they are protecting us from pathogen invasion. And this is called colonization resistance. Just by colonizing a niche and fulfilling that and keeping that closed so that more opportunistic or pathogenic bacteria cannot invade. That's not really a function we think about, but um, it's certainly vital. And we'll sort of get to this when I start talking about fecal microbiome transplants. Um, and through the antagonistic relationships with different, between potential pathogens and commensals, um, we know that uh, so, so of our healthy human microbiome produces these antimicrobial peptides, which kind of exclude more pathogenic bacteria. And finally, this is a really important one. Uh, colonization of our bodies with microbes serves to educate and develop our immune systems at birth so that we know what um, a good type of a bacteria is or what we should be mounting a response to. So this is um, sort of a critical function um, to health and we're seeing there's many hypotheses about how, how deep this role goes. Um, you may have heard of things like the hygiene hypothesis, for example. Um, but this is certainly an active work of process and not only the gut microbiome, but skin microbiome and also at other body sites. Um, so, kind of moving on, that's what a microbiome is. I want to talk about how we analyze and characterize microbiomes. And it um, all started when, with this thing called the Great Plate Count Anomaly. And a group of researchers noticed that they could take an environmental sample and look at it under the microscope, then culture it, and then look, see what could grow on this petri dish in culture. And they observed that under the microscope, it looked like there were 100 times more cells than that would grow on the culture media. And um, this suggested that not all bacteria were able to be cultured. And in particular, we now know, for example, there are certain types of bacteria that just um, completely will not culture no matter what condition um, you try to put them under. And this phylum in particular is well known um, through multiple, many attempts, has not been able to be cultured. Um, and that's because it's really difficult to replicate some of the growth conditions needed to culture these things. I work on skin. It's hard, really hard, to replicate the environment of the skin on a petri dish because you have oils, you have sweat, all these things that you need to provide to the bacteria to get the perfect conditions for them to grow. But um, in some of the environmental extremes, um, it's even more difficult to produce those conditions. So the conclusion was that culturing excludes microorganisms that won't grow on these types of culture media. It also excludes microorganisms that rely on microbe-microbe interactions. Um, and that's especially important if you're studying biofilms, for example. So, um, what came along then with the um, era of DNA sequencing and, you know, in the last 10 years there's been um, advancement in the, num the sequencing technologies um, was the idea that you could 
um, characterize and identify bacteria without culturing them. And that would be based on their DNA sequence. Um, and the technique to do this is called 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. So this is a gene. Um, it's a housekeeping gene, so all bacteria have these genes. And they're relatively conserved, so they're relatively similar across species. So you can use PCR to amplify this, um, the gene. And this shows you what the, well, I'll start here. This is the structure of this um, RNA that is produced from the DNA, the gene. And it's a structural, structural RNA or housekeeping RNA. And so these mini stems and loops in this RNA are vital to its function. But in, within the DNA sequence of this gene, you have many these, um, and this is looking at the gene across base pairs, you have these hypervariable regions that evolve very quickly. And it's within those regions, you can use those sequences to then identify what bacteria um, the gene came from. And um, so essentially, by analyzing these sequences, you can eliminate the culturing biases. So once you have your sequence data, um, you, we have databases um, of the entire tree of life with similar sequences like this. And in this case, we're looking at bacteria, but tree, these phylogenetic trees have been built from this sequence data. So you compare your sequences to these references. Um, and really, as I mentioned, the advances in the sequencing technology have been the key drivers of these types of studies and the ability to study bacteria outside of a petri dish. Um, this is a generalized workflow um, that can be used um, just to sort of simplify this down and make it clear. You can collect the bacteria on the skin. We use a swab. Um, in the gut, uh, people will collect fecal samples. Um, you isolate the genomic DNA, use PCR to amplify the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. You sequence the PCR products, and then there's a, um, multiple levels of bioinformatics analysis to identify the bacteria and to characterize the community and the diversity of the bacteria more thoroughly. So um, we did some comparisons when we first started this way back, I guess uh, almost eight years ago, to see if there really is a difference. If you compare skin bacteria um, from genomic approaches to culture-based methods, is there a difference? Um, and we do find um, there are differences, and these differences are actually pretty logical. So here are two different sites we looked at. Um, the crease by your nose, which is very oily, and then the belly button. And you can see when you compare sequencing to culture, you get the same dominant type of bacteria, which is a propiani bacteria. Um, and it's very, it's adapted to the oily conditions on the skin. But the remainder is highly variable depending on if you sequence or you culture. In the belly button, you get a much different picture from sequence and culture. And this made sense to us because this light blue bacteria, carini bacteria, is very difficult, very fastidious and difficult to grow under culture conditions. Whereas Staphylococcus is what we would consider a lab weed. It, it grows very easily. So another technique that's becoming more popular in our field is what we call whole shotgun metagenomic sequencing. And this isn't based on any particular gene at all. Um, it's, what you do is you take the same microbiome sample and you just sequence all the DNA from the skin swab. And um, that way you don't have amplification bias. You can use other markers other than the 16S 
to identify um, the bacteria. And that allows you also to sort of make some predictions about the functions of the bacteria. Because from this total DNA, you have many, many genes. And depending on what kind of genes the bacteria has, you can identify different genes and pathways that may be enriched in your sample. So that's something that's um, becoming more and more frequent uh, as um, the databases get better and as sequencing technologies um, improve. And I don't know if you guys have, have seen one taught about the sequencing technology in general, stuff like that. But um, this is just an idea to give you how, how much we've advanced. Um, when I was a postdoc fellow, we were doing, using this type of sequencing, ABI, and it costed about 2,400 per megabase per thousand or per million base pairs. And now we use this, the Illumina MySeq, and it's only um, 15 cents per megabase, which is drastic improvement, good for me with my own lab, so I don't have to spend nearly as much money, and I get much more bang for my buck with this. But this took, you know, probably about eight years for this to advance from here to here. Um, but again, uh, there were advantages and disadvantages to each type of sequencing platform. And, um, you know, depending on if you care about the rare species or the dominant species in the community, you want to sequence a certain number of um, reads. So what we usually, per sample, will sequence maybe 50,000 reads, and that will give you a sample of 50,000 bacteria, theoretically. And um, so now what sequencing isn't really a bottleneck in what we do. It's really analyzing the data and the computational effort that goes into that. So um, now that we've covered a little of the background and the techniques, um, I'm going to talk about the Human Microbiome Project, which I was fortunate enough, fortunate enough to be involved in when I was at NIH. Um, it's this um, large NIH effort. Um, they put a lot of money into characterizing the healthy human microbiome. And they chose um, a variety of sites, the nasal, the nose, um, oral sites, several skin sites, um, the GI tract, which um, they use feces as sample, and then for women they looked at the vaginal microbiome. And this was in uh, 242 healthy adults. And um, they did, they recruited the adults at Baylor University, Baylor College of Medicine and Washington University. And the goal was to t sort of determine if there's a core microbiome. Can we define what is a healthy microbiome? And um, certainly there are many different factors that could contribute to variation in the microbiome. For example, sex, age, um, the site you're studying. Um, one thing, host lifestyle, we always consider this in skin microbiome studies because, you know, depending on if the person's using hand sanitizers or different soaps, et cetera, that could affect the microbes that colonize their skin. But things like occupation or even where a person lives, their geography, their diet. So there's many of these different factors that could potentially contribute to the variability. Um, but with the human microbiome, they were trying to determine, is there a core we can identify that indicates health? And um, this is an overview of, and as I mentioned, it, uh, this is a, based on 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing. And this is an overview of the different sites that were exam examined and the averages across those sites. Um, so depending on the site of the body, the microbiome was very different. Not very surprising because the microbiome on the skin or the environment of the skin 
is much different than, say, in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, but skin sites, you know, had their own signature where they had this, as I mentioned, propiani bacteria is very common on skin because it utilizes the lipids in our sebum. And this is another look at generally just a clustering analysis, how similar are different sites to each other and the relative um, space between these um, different clusters gives you an indication of their similarity and dissimilarity. And so you can see the GI tract cluster is pretty far away from the skin and the nasal microbiome. And there's definitely also distinct oral urogenital microbiome. But this also gives you an idea, depending on how big this um, cluster is, what the variability is. So you can see the skin is pretty variable looking at those green dots. Um, they spread out pretty wide where the gastrointestinal tract is this nice, tight um, cluster. So it's not nearly as variable or diverse, for example. And um, let's see. This is just a look um, if you care about different, the specific names of the bacteria, um, what type of bacteria are present at each site. Um, so, as I mentioned, the skin has large amounts of propiani bacterium, as indicated by the size of these circles. Um, this is the oral, yeah, the oral microbiome, and this contained a lot of um, bacilli. Um, the gut microbiome contains a lot of bacteroidetes, and then the vagina contains a lot of lactobacillus. I get, that's streptococcus, I guess, which is a bacilli as well. Okay, bacteroids and then lactococcus. So yeah, the size of these circles indicates how abundant those um, type of bacteria are at each of those sites. So moving on to some example of health and disease in the um, human microbiome. So these were the five different body sites that were examined by the Human Microbiome Project and um, part of the project was also to get some sort of preliminary exam examination of how these microbial communities were changed in states of disease. Um, I've listed here some of the types of diseases that could, um, that are hypothesized to have a microbial component to them. For example, in the skin, acne, um, a type of dermatitis called atopic dermatitis, even psoriasis. Um, the GI tract, I'll talk a little bit about obesity, but also intestinal bowel disorders such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, and in the mouth, a good example is um, gingivitis. So there's been various studies conducted to examine how these microbial communities are changed in these disease states. So I wanted to talk about um, some examples from the gut because um, we, we see this in the news quite a bit and I think the latest thing I saw in the news was they showed that um, artificial sweeteners um, can change the gut microbiome and make us more, make, make, make people more um, more their glycemic response, I, I can't think of the word, <laughs> sorry, that makes their, gly they respond in a way that like um, a diabetic person would um, respond um, to the artificial sweeteners. When in fact, you know, you think you're using an artificial sweetener and you're not, to not have the effects of sugar, but in fact, it even has worse effects than sugar on your blood glucose. And they found that these effects were mediated through the gut microbiome. So that's the latest um, thing. And I think there was a New York Times article. I want you to repeat. Huh? I want you to repeat what you said. Repeat it? OK. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't really planning to talk about that. I'm just recalling from it. So 
because my brother emailed me about it and said, oh, do I stop drinking diet soda? So they looked, they found that um, artificial sweeteners have a bad effect on blood glucose levels um, and that um, the response to artificial, our body's response to artificial sweeteners um, is a response that uh, what you would predict would happen with sugar when in fact you know you wouldn't think that would be the case right because they're artificial sweeteners and so they found that um, so the reason they even pursued this was because artificial sweeteners aren't absorbed by our intestine they're actually they just move right through but because the gut microbiota is in the middle of the intestine, they thought, oh, may maybe it's exerting some effect through that. And they did find that, indeed, um, the gut microbiome was not only correlated, changes in that microbiome were not only correlated with artificial sweetener use, but they were able to cause this sort of glycemic um, the glycemic response that they saw that was aberrant to a norm, normal glycemic response. And they did it in humans, as, in mice and humans. A lot of these experiments, you have to do mice, use mice to show some sort of causation. Um, and so they did, they put people on this um, diet with the artificial sweeteners and showed the same um, type of response the mice had. Um, this was for saccharin, though, and um, they didn't show it for any of them. Saccharin's not that much popular, that popular anymore, right? I think it's more like aspartame and Splenda that's used, and they didn't show it for that. So, I mean, I'm always on the fence about these things. Of course, water is the best thing for you, but. <laughs> I do like my Diet Coke. Um, <laughs> and they didn't look at things like high fructose corn syrup and the effect of that on your glycemic levels and your blood glucose levels. So I think, um, yeah, the, there's always all these um, news stories coming out about this recently. So um, hopefully you know, learning a little bit about this will um, help decipher those news stories sometimes. But, um, so I wanted to talk about the gut microbiome and diet and obesity specifically, because I think this is a good example. Um, and what was found several years ago was that there, people could group by their gut microbiomes. There were three main groups, and we call them enterotypes. Um, and depending on what group you're in, your microbial um, gut composition is different. And um, so, and it clustered pretty well, but depending, so for example, this one group, the yellow group, has a high concentration of this bacteria, bacteroids. Um, and they really couldn't find anything to explain this clustering. It wasn't based on age or gender or body mass index, really. So another study then looked at diet. So what, how does your diet affect your gut microbiome? And they found that depending on, um, Depending on what type of diet you are on, you, ha you are associated with a different enterotype. So this bacteroidetes enterotype, which is shown here in this green cluster that's high in this concentration of bacteroides bacteria, was associated with people that had diets high in animal fats, for example, a Western diet. And this other enterotype, um, was rich in a Prevotella bacteria and was associated with a more agrarian diet consisting of carbohydrates. So, um, and in the same paper, they also were able to shift people's microbiome by putting them on different diets. So, it seems like diet does have um, effect on the microbiome, whether that's 
good or bad. There's still a lot of studies being done about this, but this is one of the landmark studies. Um, it's now getting very old, 2005, I guess, but it was in mice, and they looked at um, the gut bacteria of these genetically obese mice. Um, they have a mutation in a gene that makes them obese, and then their counterparts, their brothers and sisters that were lean, and they found that the obese mice had enrichment of this bacteria, um, a Firmicutes bacteria, um, compared to bacteroides. Um, and then they also looked at diet-induced obesity. So they fed them mice, just normal mouse chow, and then they fed the mice what would be a Western diet for a mouse, I guess which would be essentially like a McDonald's diet for a mouse that's high in fat, um, high in cholesterol probably. <laughs> but it also, these mice also exhibited increased abundance of this Firmicutes type bacteria. And this group later went on to show that these type of bacteria were able to extract more nutrients from the food than this bacteria. So by having more of this bacteria, you're able to get more calories out of your food. Um, whereas if you have more of the bacteroides, you're not, you don't absorb as many calories and maybe you don't get as fat. Um, so here's some examples of other um, gut-associated microbiome diseases where we see shifts in um, the bacterial populations. And it ranges from the different types of inflammatory bowel disorders, type 2 diabetes, and in infants, um, necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, so I'll move on to a little bit to the skin. And um, this is kind of my area of focus. but. Back a few years ago, we looked at um, 20 different body sites across the human body and swabbed um, a bunch of healthy individuals and sequenced what was on their skin um, just to build a sort of topographical map. And um, as you know, the skin is very different depending on what body site you're looking at, like the bottom of your feet are a thicker skin, whereas your scalp is hairy. Um, so depending on the site, we found very different types of bacteria um, that colonize those sites. We also looked at interpersonal variation and how like, you would differ from your neighbor, for example. And what we find is that people generally are colonized by the same dominant type of bacteria but it's this remainder up here that's highly variable and could even be transient that we pick up from environmental sources. So the microbiome of the skin has been also associated with a number of skin diseases. And um, I talked a little bit about this dermatitis, atopic dermatitis, which is in children, um, psoriasis, um, these all uh, have been associated with shifts in um, the bacterial populations from the healthy state to the disease state. Um, acne is interesting because it's associated with Propionibacterium acnes, this type of bacteria, but it's not necessarily the bacteria, the species of bacteria, but the individual strain of bacteria that is associated. So, um, oh, this is the diseased over here. I cut this in half so it was bigger. But there are more of these different types of strains in acne skin versus healthy skin. And um, they did some genetic analysis of those strains and found that they contained um, a lot of genes that encode pathogens and virulence factors that may be important in the disease. Dandruff is um, associated with changes in the fungal population of the scalp. 
And that makes a whole lot of sense because a lot of the dandruff shampoos, such as um, Head and Shoulders, contain antifungal agents, and they actually work pretty well. Um, so I'm going to focus a little bit and on this example from atopic dermatitis, um, which is an itchy red skin rashy condition that affects infants generally, and it's a high amount of infants, about 15% in the U.S. And the, the interesting thing about this disease is its incidence increases throughout, increases as time goes on. Um, so in the past, you know, 100 years, we've seen a huge increase in the incidence. Um, and what that has to say about the cause I'm not sure other than it's likely to be something environmental that's been changing in our environment. For example, perhaps hygiene, um, antibiotics, something that's changed in our lifestyles in the past um, century. Um, but this, in these um, sites that are affected by atopic dermatitis, there's um, typically Staph aureus um, colonizes and infects. And um, Staph aureus isn't normally present on the skin. Um, it's, and it can be a very pathogenic bacteria. So um, we wanted to look at the dynamics of Staph aureus colonization during these flares that occur. Um, so we looked at controls. And then we looked at people with atopic dermatitis um, before they had a flare. Um, those that had flares but no treatment, those that got treatment, and then after the flare resolved. And we found that the flare coincided with the huge increase in Staphylococcus aureus. Um, but treatment, and that's this um, pink bacteria here, but when you treated the patients, that they had less Staphylococcus aureus, and when the flares finally resolved, then also the Staphylococcus aureus resolves as well. So that points to these changes that are occurring on the skin during um, atopic dermatitis. But the real challenge now is to determine if the Staph aureus is causing the flares or if it's perhaps a different type of bacteria or a combination. There's probably genetic factors involved as well, and this makes um, dissecting these diseases is very difficult um, when you take into account all the factors that can contribute to them. Um, I, kind of, I like to mention this because I think it's kind of cool to think about. Um, you know, we talk about the bacterial microbiome all the time, but in fact on the skin there's many different microbes in addition the bacteria, um, fungi, I mentioned briefly about dandruff, but we also have these small mites um, that live in our hair follicles um, down, so this is a cross section of skin, and this is the hair follicle. They live down in the, um, along the hair shaft and in, in this area that's connected to the sebaceous gland, and these are called um, Demodex mites, I guess I don't have that in here. But um, they're more common on older individuals, so unless you're over 30, um, you probably won't have them. So my lab really wanted to see these mites under the microscope, and I was the only person that qualified as being old enough to have them. So um, it's kind of a cool thing you can do. You can just take a little super glue, put it on a slide, and then put it on your face, and they're typically like in the forehead or in this area. You wait for that to dry, and when you pull it off your skin, you have a cast of this, um, this hair follicle sebaceous gland here. And the mites will be sticking to those casts, and you can put that under the microscope and see um, those mites that are on there. It's, it's actually quite gross, but it's cool too, I think. <laughs> and you can see it um, just under low power microscope, in fact. So what they do in here is they feed on 
sebum and these dead skin cells, maybe even the bacteria that are colonizing in here. And um, they have their own microbiomes too, so their guts are colonized by bacteria. And um, there's been some association with their gut microbiota and rosacea um, and other types of dermatitis um, that seemingly they may be colonized with bacteria that inflame these um, sebaceous and glands and hair follicles. Um, I like to think of them as exfoliating factors, but they may make you feel creepy or crawly. So finally, I want to talk about therapeutics and diagnostics. And I was, again, you know, showing my husband this presentation last night. He's not a scientist. And he wanted me to explain fecal microbiome transplants. And, you know, I tried to explain it to him, but he can relate to this, which is a lawn. And, um, he has often killed our lawn with weed, weed, whatever it is, pesticides. And if you don't repopulate this soil, it just gets run over by weeds, right? Um, so how can we avoid this? You can um, use probiotics, which is seed, your good microbes. You can use per prebiotics to promote good microbial growth, which would be um, a type of fertilizer, for example. Or you can just transplant the entire ecosystem, which is the equivalent of a fecal microbiome transplant. Um, so really the problem is after you wipe out your microbiome, how do you um, make it normal again, back to here, to nice grass and not the weeds? Um, so this is um, the idea behind fecal microbiome transplant therapy. And um, actually, it's very effective um, treatment for these recurrent Clostridium difficile infections. Um, so these infections occur generally in patients that um, will have transplants, for example, because they're put on very heavy-duty antibiotics. And when you have an antibiotic, when you're given an antibiotic, it just decimates, completely decimates your gut microflora. So normally you have a nice amount of colonization, then it wipes out most of the bacteria when you're given these broad spectrum antibiotics. And this particular type of bacteria is resistant to antibiotics because it forms spores. So then even, then you're repopulated by this bacterium C. difficile, uh, which can, it can, cause, it can kill people um, uh, and is, can be very serious infection. Um, and so how do you, the question was, how do you keep, how do you cure people of this without giving them more antibiotics? So someone came up with the idea, and I don't know who came up with this idea. Hey, if we just transplant fecal microbiome in there, um, it might work. And it, it works very well. In fact, um, numerous investigators have achieved cure rates of greater than 90%. Um, they're thinking about using it for other applications, such as severe constipation, inflammatory bowel disease, even obesity. And it's, um, depending on where, what hospitals, they do them here at Penn, but depending on the hospital, they'll give an enema with the sample that's been, you know, purified, not purified, but pulverized. Or they'll um, give it through it. They're not drinking it. They're just, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not, that they can put it through a tube down the throat. Um, and now we're starting to think about this for other organ systems. And 
you know, people ask me while on the skin, people might be totally grossed out by that to transplant microbiota. I'm like, yeah, but I'm totally grossed out by this. So I think, we, I think if we can show that this would be advantageous, for example, with the atopic dermatitis example I gave you, we have this overgrowth of staph aureus. Can we replace the staph aureus with more healthy skin bacteria? And I think that may be an application in the future. So to touch on probiotics a little bit, they're live microorganisms um, that have health benefits. And we see them everywhere now. Um, Activia, Activia, for example. Um, and the indications have been for diarrhea, IBD, et cetera. But the, the tough thing about this is that the FDA doesn't really regulate probiotics. So there's really no definition. And they can make claims, health claims, with having FDA, without having the FDA approval because they're a food. They're not a drug or um, a biological. Um, and so they can make these claims. Um, I know a lot of companies, skincare companies, are also thinking about probiotic applications for skin. Um, for example, hand sanitizers. If you're going to wipe out your bacterial ecosystem of the skin, why not replace it with something um, healthy? Those packets are in uh, cups are the yogurt cups. Uh huh. These. No, no, the other. I see the small cup, the yogurt. Those. Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah, it looks like it. The yogurt is also a replacement for the back. I mean, gastrointestinal bacteria. Um. Yeah, I mean that's the claim. Um, yeah, so it supplies uh, many of these yogurts, whether or not they're activi activity, activity, um, or officially a pro yogurt's naturally a probiotic because it contains. You have to use live cultures to make the yogurt to firm make it for the fermentation process, and they're generally these lactic acid bacteria and bifidobacteria. So even before Activia what came into existence, there was yogurt and it contains active life cultures. These may be supplemented with a little bit more, I'm not sure. Um, but um, they're live bacteria that you ingest and um, supposedly make it down to the intestine and colonize. In uh, developing countries, people consume a lot of yogurt. Oh, they really? Have yeah. and they, they are very healthy. You know, and, and people there, they advise that you know, someone who has uh, gastrointestinal problems, they say, take the yogurt every mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true, and I know, you know, if I was ever on antibiotics, my doctor would say, be sure to eat lots of yogurt, and maybe that's to recolonize. Um, so these benefits, um, I think, have been, even before people or companies were marketing them as, you know, these microbiome enhancers, they were probably, there's probably many health benefits even before that. Websites they even promote saying that consuming the yogurt uh, improves your skin health. Huh. Well, I have run into skincare products. Sephora sells them that contain yogurt extracts or whatever uh, yogurt products, and um, there's really you know I. The, what's good for your gut in terms of microbiome is not always good for your skin. So, I mean, I think that's probably just a marketing ploy in terms of for the skincare products, but I, I like the idea. Um, but I don't know if that's really backed up, the skincare parts backed up by science. 
on the outside. However, you know, you could imagine a scenario where your gut microbiota would have a role in enhancing your skin health um, because, um, you know, your, the nutrients come from your gut, your immune cells populate the gut, and then um, can go to the skin as well. So, yeah, it's possible. Um, and this is just um, a schematic of how a probiotic works, the repopulation dynamics. And some more examples. They'll have access to these slides, right? Okay. Um, these are some examples of probiotics that I found interesting. This is a lozenge made with this streptococcus bacteria that um, you can use to reduce bad breath. Um, and it, this type of bacteria in particular reduces oral volatile sulfur compounds. Um, lactobacillus rhamnosus has been shown to reduce frequency of gestational diabetes. Um, and then some of these different types of bifidobacteria, lactobacillus can decrease incidence of eczema when mothers take them. Uh, prenatally, I guess I should be taking that. I'm not. <laughs> um, so there's a whole lot of different examples of how probiotics do have benefit. For the most part, they're in the gut, but um, this, as I mentioned, this is a lozenge for oral microbiome, and then this lactobacillus has been used as an intravaginal treatment. Um, for bacteria, BV, yeah, bacterial vaginosis. Um, so the, on the other hand, there's these prebiotics, and this isn't a live bacteria. This is like the fertilizer, and you can alter con the conditions of your community or of your ecosystem um, and encourage the growth of beneficial microbes. So in this case, ensures marketing prebiotics um, in their drinks. And you know, there's thought that certain oligosaccharides can encourage lactobacilli and bifidobacteria in the GI tract. But again, this is all loosely regulated by the FDA, so <laughs> Um, it's unclear, a lot, a lot of it's unclear what the health benefits really are of some of these um, prebiotics and probiotics. And finally, in the future, um, I think we'll see a lot more diagnostics and prognostics based on the microbiome just because it can, it's such an information rich readout of the environment. Um, microbes, um, change in number rapidly and in response to the environment. And in most cases, you can easily collect a sample. So for diseases that are difficult to diagnose or even variants of diseases, this may be a useful type of diagnostic. Um, it could also be used to predict what treatment will work best or what antibiotic will work best. Um, so th those are some potential applications that I see in the future. Um, so to summarize, I hope I've shown you that we're not alone, that our microbial cells outnumber human cells by a factor of 10. And these have critical functions in educating the immune system, for example, controlling pathogenic species, nutrition, we talked a little bit about these approaches we use for identifying microbial communities, the different body sites that are colonized, and some examples of disease in which the microbiome's involved. And um, finally, the therapeutics that are mostly a work in progress at this point, um, but in the future I think we will see more. Um, based on the microbiome. And here I've listed some resources. Um, I think this site was very good. I found this is um, 
an NIH site, the genome.gov. And also this site, there's quite a few tools for teaching microbiome and um, learning about the microbiomes. So hopefully those are useful to you. And of course, if you have any questions, my email address is on the first slide. And you'll get copies of the slides. Okay. done it on myself, so yeah. Super glue and you put it on the yeah, yeah, you'll have to let it um, dry though. It's just like an exfoliant okay. that kind of brings up, I mean, you can, uh, don't, it's not going to tear off your skin yeah. if that's what you're worried about. Yeah, I just want to make sure, you know, because um, some people's skin really sensitive and others, you know, so, but you did it and you didn't have a problem. I should, there is like an article, maybe I can send it to you um, about how to do it. I think, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always talk about those. I always talk about the mice in our eyebrows. Really? Show me under the microscope. There you go. You can show them under the microscope. No excuse now. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm trying to think of what else. What else we do? How oh, we do, we just did that for fun once. Um, we made liquid nitrogen ice cream not that long ago. <laughs> Oh, really? Well, you need to do it well, you need an oil immersion lens. Oh, yeah, you probably it's don't so have exciting. that. Yeah. Yeah, that's the problem with the bacteria. That's why the mites are so good. You can, um, you can see them. What about fungi? Could you, like, um, you know, I don't know. I guess the feet have a lot of fungi on them. I'm trying to think of a way you could visualize those. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you might see some there. <laughs> oh, no. I mean, it's not human microbes, but I do the pond water all the time. Right. Any last questions? I'm going to write at 5.30, but... Yeah, uh, it's an older article, and it's um, with someone, this guy in our department um, sort of perfected the technique, I guess, and it was just this little letter to one of our journals he wrote, like maybe in the 70s, but I'll try to dig it up and send it to you. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. No, that's, I think that's how the school now. Yeah.